Hello. Hi, how are you? Good, how's it going? I'm okay. I'm good. Where, where are you? I'm Your work? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's much easier uh, for the get the quiet here and um, I've got my like Zoom set up and all that, so. Very nice, yeah. Looks, the, the picture quality seems quite good. Or is that just your computer, your laptop? No, it's just the, the lab iMac that I've stolen. Nice. I'm, I'm actually in, in Michigan for the weekend. Nice. I, Do you yeah. have a cabin? Um, it's, it's more of a house than a cabin, but it, yeah, it's really nice. What, uh, what part? We're in Michiana. Do you know Michiana? Not yeah. far from the border. Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful little community. We like. it's, I mean, last time we were in a more densely populated area, which we liked, but here, here we're, we're in the woods, which is nice, but you know, we, Shabbat was hard because there was nobody to watch the kids or to do anything, so. <laughs> yeah, yes, but we're, but we're we, had, we went hiking in the dunes today and that was nice, yeah. Well, thanks for showing up for uh, the introduction. Oh. I appreciate it. Yeah, I don't want to miss it. Um, yeah, uh, Charles' uh, description was, uh, I, I will not possibly be able to live, live up to that, but um, I'll do my best. Uh -huh. Like I'm going to explain everything in half an hour. Miracle of life, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, so. well, I'm sure, it'll be, I'm sure it'll be great. So you you, you finished your postdoc, right? Now you're, you're a reacher, you're an assistant research professor, is that is that right? Or yeah, it's basically just uh so COVID like another postdoc or basically, yeah. COVID killed the killed the academic job market um pretty thoroughly. And so getting the title change uh, allowed me to apply for my own funding, basically. Um, where I don't have my own group, but I can apply for my own support. Okay. Uh, and so yeah, I've submitted a federal grant application over the summer. And uh if we're I think we're about to get funded. That's so which, which is great so that, that, that make you a head of project or is that exactly yeah it's it's uh the the i'm the principal investigator on the grant so it um it would be something that would be a good bargaining chip for applying for positions because it's the kind of grant they want you to get if you have your own group Got it. uh so yeah so it was just an effort to try to um, bolster the resume a bit uh but it's basically i'm basically i'm in the same lab doing the same sort of science, but maybe a little bit more independently. So what, what, what comes next? When are you gonna try and apply for uh, the next step? So I just interviewed for a faculty position at University of Montreal. Wow. I um, have an interview coming up at, at uh, Calgary in uh, the first week of April. So. Are you aiming for Canada or that's just what happens to be out there? I, I, uh, I, given the circumstances, I wouldn't be against it. Um, but you like cold weather, you must like some cold. <laughs> no, not necessarily. Yeah. I mean, hey, Calgary has really rough winters, but it's got a lot of sun. So, it does, yeah. Yeah. But my, uh, my mom is from the Canadian prairies, actually. So she's okay. from Saskatoon. So she knows. Oh, wow. That's yeah. really pretty. It's very, yeah, it's very cold. I've, I've been there a lot. Very cold, but yeah, very nice. Yeah, so we'll we'll see what happens. I think the the Montreal thing was just um, last week, uh, mm. and uh, it's who knows when that could come. But yeah, but I have to learn French. Are you back, Rabbi Glick? I'm not. Oh. I'm still. I'm still in in the in the and woods. How is it? It's really nice. You know, Shabbat, I was telling Jackson, Shabbat was hard because we had nowhere to go and nobody to babysit the kids. So we were, we were, it was, it was we were exhausted. We said, we're, we're going back home early. That's what we said at the end of it. But then, so do you know if they stream, if they're going to stream Jackson's and if they stream the one this afternoon? This you know what, I'm, um, I'm, I, I'm be the one who would stream it. I don't quite know how to do it. So oh, if gonna... somebody streamed that this morning, I know Phyllis will agree with me. You got to watch it because okay. these people, all of them, there must have been six girls who were in their 60s who grew up at our synagogue, raved mm -hmm. about how our synagogue made them want to be Jewish hmm. and, and work for Jewish causes. That's they, amazing. It was fabulous. When, when did they grow up? Are we talking about the Tabachi? They're, they're 67 and 68 and 65. So 
It Tabachnik was or Babin. Rabbi Tabachnik. A couple of them said they had Rabbi Babin for a tiny bit, but mostly the 25 years Rabbi Tabachnik was there. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, it was just so nice to hear how yes. what they loved. Uh -huh. You know, the kinds of things Lovely. that David does. They talked about how this one teacher they had, Mr. Jablon, and his wife had been the secretary for years, mm -hmm. Rabbi Tabachnik, the kinds of things that engaged them. And that, yeah, they didn't love going to Hebrew school, but they loved being there once they got there with the people. And right. I mean, well, they well, knew well. every little bit about our synagogue. It was so nice. Well, cool. Where we we're, we're a synagogue with deep roots, you know, we should be. Proud we are. Of that's right. That's why you know I wanted to tell you that that we need to continue that. If we do that kind of a job with like Reese from yesterday and Renee Slade's girls, and I mean, it's just such a nice thing. We have a lot of yeah, yeah. And we have a lot of good kids. Yeah, I, I we know when I remember when I first came here and I met it, um, who were some of the kids who then. Um, Matthew, not Matthew, Matthew was already graduated. Um, there was Ben Brotman yeah, yeah. and uh, what's his name who went on to uh, uh, Brandeis with a scholarship. Oh, yeah. Um, um, yeah, Matthew, that's his name. Matthew, too. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, ben, yeah. when he was a little tiny boy, we used to call him, Carol Flank, I remember that. We used to call him the little rabbi. Uh -huh. because he 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 had, was learning the service when he was five years old uh, <laughs> and i think he's ben, still ben or matthew or both who was the little rabbi ben or matthew ben oh yeah, ben, ben was a little rabbi oh absolutely uh -huh. i can see that <laughs> so well, carol knows all the kids she had them in preschool and then Sunday school and I mean we had a bunch of nice kids. I still do. <clears throat> but did, did you did you remember Iris from Oh back? of course. Oh are you kidding? Oh when she saw Howard and I come on she was like ecstatic. I mean because I was very close friends with her mother. Her mother uh, worked in the gift shop every Sunday and her mother worked at Lord and Taylor and her mother mm -hmm. was quite a person. There was just a whole group of women that would be like between 90 and 100 now and that were, you know, buddies. And their daughters were all there today. Mm. It's one, of of Zoom. Yeah. one of the wonders of Zoom is you can, you can gather people Right. Over, right. That's really. Yeah. And you know, those nostalgic things are fun to do. Mm -hmm. yep. And it's funny, some of those girls now look exactly like their mothers. It's really uh -huh. fun. <laughs> the world, the world keeps on changing, but it also remains the same. Right. So. It... Yes. Well, and Mimi knew those people also. So. <clears throat> We're going to wait two, three more minutes, and then we will begin. To learn about our brains. <laughs> about our brains and about the, the way the world works. Hi, Norma. Hi, how are you? OK, how are you doing? But that was fun today, wasn't it? It was nice. Um, I'm much older, but. Um, well, but you knew Helene, and you knew the girls. Yeah, I knew the girls. Um, I remember Doris Gruskin so well. She yeah. was a doll. Yeah. She was just. Yeah, Doris's daughter was there, Rabbi Glick. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, good. Yes, yes. because That's she nice. was friends with, with uh, Iris Krasnow. And um, Debbie, who lives in Israel, she came mm. on. And those girls have been friends for years and years. They mm. Zoom on every other Sunday. See, Wonderful. Fran is four years younger than I am. She's my sister's age, and Iris is even younger. Only a year younger. They said they were two. Year, they were a year apart when they went to camp. Their she mother put them on a train when they were eight, nine years old to go to camp. Um, she said she's sixty-six. My sister's. Um, well, I'm seventy-one, so she's um, sixty-seven. Yeah, yeah. But it was fun. It was really nice to reminisce. Uh -huh. Yeah, but it was interesting that Iris didn't remember me because she just kind of like decide. So 
Are you sure she said that? She didn't say anything when I said who I was. She like she didn't recognize me at all. And I oh. used my maiden name because no, I no, she went like this when you said Meisel. She did. Is she? Yes, definitely. Hmm. I figured she would know my sister more than she would know me. Probably. And the first man school at Greenfield Park was right behind it. They closed the street on Woodbine, so it connected the park to the school, and it had a field house there. So it made it very advantageous living on Forest Avenue right behind there. My God, that was like a kid's playground. Terrific. Yeah, Judy Nemirovsky now looks exactly like Barbara, her mother. It's funny. And her sister, Holly, was always the cutest little girl. Now, Nemirovsky's, they used to sit by us in Shul. Right, yeah. On the left side there. On the, yeah, the on the opposite side of where I sit. <laughs> yeah, and Alan uh, Nemirovsky was close with my father and um, he yeah, handled he was, the insurance for my family. He was nice. He was a and nice. My uncle kid. Maury Wenger, the Wengers that lived on East Avenue, not the ones that oh. are married. Yeah, no, I know that. Right. So it was a group. I mean, it always has been. Lenny uh, Grossman is my big brother. He's always been my big brother. He's five years older than I am. He's mm. He was at the Wenger's house all the time. He was close with my cousin Ronnie. I mean, it's it's a click kind of like. I guess you'd say, but a nice click because we yeah. were always there for each other. Mm -hmm. So it kind of gets spoiled. <laughs> and, and you're always there for me. You're always there. There were like about 25. You're like, come on. It was good. Everyone, I think we're, we're going to begin. Well, Senator. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. This is our second temple talk in our first series. We're going to be continuing to have um, these talks over the next um, couple months. This is really a way for us to hear from all of our members some of the interesting and transformative work that they are doing. Um, and we hear, we hear about them at Kiddush or other places. We hear a little bit about their work, but this is a way for us to hear more and to uh, understand from the inside parts of life that are uh, very interesting. And so we, 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 a, a synagogue in Hebrew is Beit HaKnesset. We don't call it a house of prayer, but a house of gathering. So it's not only a place where we talk about Jewish related themes, but also we expand our minds out and we talk about all of life. We gather to talk about um, everything. So this afternoon, uh, we will be hearing from Temple Harzai member and board member and my friend Jackson Cohen. Uh, Jackson received his PhD from in neuroscience from University of Illinois, Chicago. He did five years of postdoctoral work at the University of Chicago. He is now an assistant research professor there. And he's also for fun getting a master's in analytics <laughs> at Georgia Tech. It's not that much fun. I, I wouldn't have thought it was fun, but that but that, that's how you put it. So, <laughs> so uh, today he'll be telling us about the miracle of life in just half an hour, right? Everything, um, how our minds translate um, the input from our senses, the how they it gets built into memories and um, sensations and feelings. Um, consciousness seems really um, incredibly interesting to me, um, and how our brain connects all of it and. Um, I, I just think it's going to be great. I, I've, I've had so many interesting conversations with Jackson, and he is always um, willing to go very deep, and he is always very open in the way he approaches all of it. So I'm looking forward to hearing um, how he will talk about it and address it this morning. If you have any questions, please uh, put them into the chat, and you can either address them as he's talking or at the very end. Um, and so I give it over to Jackson. Thank you. Well, thank you for the very kind introduction. I've put together some slides that I'll put on the um, uh, put on the screen. If I'm allowed to share, can everyone see those? Is that on everyone's screen now? Yeah. Great. So, yeah, my the the description on the announcement uh, said I would basically reveal everything about the brain in half an hour, and I, I wish I could do that. But uh, I will talk a little bit about how our brains make sense of the world around us. But first, I'd like to start with a, a more broad question. So, and this is a question that's often posed by Jeff Lickman, who is a, a Harvard neurobiologist. If the brain is a mile, how far have we walked? 
a half mile, quarter mile, 100 feet, or perhaps the distance of Rabbi Glick's walk from home to Shoal. If anyone had to guess, and it doesn't have to be any of these options, what do you think, uh, what do you think the answer is? If the complete understanding of the brain is a mile, how far have we come? An inch. One inch. We have one inch. Yeah. Anyone else? I can tell you the distance from home to shul in the winter feels very different. <laughs> so we should induce a, introduce a season parameter into this question. Um, so Jeff Lickman's response is three inches. And I think that's actually pretty accurate. And while that may sound a little bit pessimistic, uh, I think we've actually come a real long way in a hundred years. So for example, uh, on the left here is Santiago Ramon y Cajal. Uh, he was a, he's a Nobel Prize winning uh, physician. And it was really his seminal work that led to our modern understanding of the brain as a collection of distinct cells that are all interconnected. And so an interesting story about Cajal is that he wanted to be an artist, but his father wanted him to be a physician. So he did both. His painstaking recreations and drawings of the things that he saw under a microscope really gave us our first insight into actually the cells that composed the brain. Uh, and it led to his Nobel Prize was specifically for putting forth the idea that uh, the brain was composed of distinct units and wasn't this giant interconnected web, uh, so to speak, uh, of one big space, basically mega cell. And here on the right, this looks like a piece of art, but actually it's not. This is a brain. This is a brain that's been genetically engineered to express fluorescent proteins in differing amounts in each cell. Uh, it's actually called the brain bow, and it uh, is actually created by Jeff Lickman's group. And this allows us to visualize the individual cells uh, it, with much greater detail um, than previous methods. And so while, um, while we still have a long way to go in merely the 100 years or so that have elapsed since Cajal's first drawings, we've now actually gotten pretty precise genetic control over the brain uh, and uh, really have begun to understand its complexity with uh, great detail in just that short time span. So I would argue that the brain is humankind's really biggest remaining scientific frontier. And, and I'll use the caveat of on this planet. So there's a, a vast array of physical phenomena that we don't understand that exists outside of our universe. Uh, but uh, here on, on this planet, I think, you know, obviously I'm biased, but I think the brain uh, is probably our biggest, biggest challenge. So for example, uh, here on the left is uh, a worm. It is C. elegans and it has 302 neurons. On the right is C. elegans brain. We know every cell, we know who it connects to, and we can record all of them at the same time. And yet C. elegans can emit behavior that we can't predict based on the activity of its brain. So with those 302 cells, we, there's things that emerge that even we can't understand necessarily or predict from just simply observing the brain in action. And what this says is that really the brain has emergent properties, right? We can't understand the brain by thinking of it as a collection of these individual cells because just by connecting them all together, new properties emerge from those interactions. You can think of this uh, analogous to like an ant colony. A single ant is quite, quite stupid, frankly, but if you put it into a colony of several thousand, now that colony begins to emit behavior that no single ant is capable of doing. And so it's these emergent properties that really carry the, our thinking about uh, the brain and how it mediates uh, our uh, experiences and our interactions with the environment. So 302 neurons and we're perplexed. Well, our brain has 80 billion. And the number of connections in the human brain actually exceeds the number of stars in the Milky Way. So what are we to do to gain insight uh, into this? And how are, what different ways are there for studying uh, the relationship between, uh, say, the brain and behavior? I'll also point out that while this is a cool graphic, it's actually drawn somewhat wrong. Information does not enter here in the front, at least with respect to vision, it comes in the back. So, Whoever drew this was probably not a neuroscientist, but I, I appreciate the thought. So I, I would like to, uh, to have you guys think of the brain as a network of networks. 
And I'm not going to go through any of this biochemistry, so I'm not going to any, make anyone sick by talking about all of these different molecular interactions. But I'd like you to appreciate that even at the smallest level of the brain, that is, uh, say, a sink within a single cell, there's a complex network of interactions taking place. So, for example, when neurotransmitters like dopamine or glutamate, a uh, particular neurotransmitter in the brain, activate their receptors, this leads to a cascade of events inside the cell where different molecules and different enzymes begin talking to one another, ultimately leading to activation of a particular enzyme or expression of particular genes, and each receptor has its own cascade that it might act through. We, again, this comes back to the idea of emergence because these are just chains of molecules, but simply by chaining them together, they've, they've, they've emerged new functions and they actually function uh, sort of like machines, even though they're just made of, of the same biological material that uh, say an algae is made of or uh, yeast is made of or what have you. They're the same building blocks, but by chaining them together in complex ways, you can generate uh, novel functions. But again, just hope you appreciate that each of these uh, interactions sort of represents its own network, but all of this is happening inside a cell. But we can similarly find networks outside of cells. So this is a, uh, a, uh, a computer recreation of actual anatomical data of two neurons communicating with one another, or at least the junctions of where they can communicate. So this green uh, fiber here is a projection along a, a neuron. And each of these little uh, connection points here between this green and the blue cell are synapses. These are the points of communications between neurons. And you can also see that there's a bunch of other synapses where there's not a labeled cell. Those are also connections, but they're just not with the cells that are in this image uh, or, or cells that are, uh, are stained, I should say. And so even here in this particular microcosm of two interactions between two cells, there's a network happening, right? Activity along at this particular connection at this synapse can influence the activity of this cell, just as this uh, synapse and this synapse can as well. And so there's, again, we've gone from molecular uh, network interactions inside neurons to interactions between particular subsets of, of, of two cells. And we can also look at this more locally. Hi. Oh. So within a brain region, for example, there would be hundreds of thousands to millions of neurons in our brains, like within a small, uh, say a millimeter of our cortex, hundreds of thousands of neurons. And all of those cells, uh, in some way or another are connected to each other, forming a small local network. So these are uh, images of the, the main excitatory, the main cells in our brain that convey in information to other parts of the brain. And what I, I hope you can see along these, uh, these areas here where these webs are going out to one another is that th this forms a network in the sense of this cell can influence the activity of this cell, which can in turn influence the activity of this cell. So they're all interdependent which can generate very complex circuit, uh, circuit light-like interactions. Moreover, not just within a local area, long range connections are also prevalent in the brain. This also is not an artistic uh, recreation. These, uh, each, each of these little lines here represents a pathway with which information travels from one part of the brain to another. And so in addition to these local networks, these local networks connect into other local networks in other parts of the brain. And so through these interactions, you can begin to generate uh, you know, complex uh, neurobiological phenomenon, such as what takes in light from the, the periphery and converts it into, say, our understanding that that's our, our friend's face uh, standing across the hallway uh, at Scholl. And what's really in incredible about these networks is that they can span essentially the entire brain. So this is a, a mouse brain viewed from the side. And what they've done here is they've labeled three uh, different neurons with three different colors. So there's a red, a green, and a yellow cell. And this is just a cross section of the mouse brain shown for reference. Up here is the front of the brain where the olfactory system uh, does most of its work. And this is the, uh, the output towards the spinal cord. And what you can appreciate is these three neurons up in the, these are in the motor parts of the brain. They're actually conveying information to distinct brain areas. So for example, this blue cell is talking to an area largely involved in motor control. 
the yellow cell is talking to an area that's mostly involved in uh, relaying information to other parts of the brain. And this red cell is actually going down into the hindbrain, communicating with areas that are involved in locomotion. And so even within an area, there's a really complex uh, system of signals that are being uh, routed out of it, uh, making understanding these, these kinds of network interactions very complex. Okay, so with that sort of extremely broad overview, I uh, just want to talk briefly about the tools and methods that we have for studying the brain and what different levels are there. So I'll give you a, a few examples, and this is by far not exhaustive, uh, but uh, hopefully will help sort of uh, uh, ground your thinking a bit. So we can, we can think about studying the brain at a genetic level. What genes get expressed in cells after I study Hebrew, for example? What actually enables me to learn new information, uh, at least in terms of uh, the, the genes that are responsible for mediating those kinds of processes? We can ask about the molecular level. So, uh, for example, it's really important to traffic uh, uh, proteins uh, essential for neuron function inside the cells. And so there's a whole array of molecular components that actually make that possible. Uh, at the cellular level, we might ask what cellular processes, kind of like in the example I showed you earlier, are taking place inside a cell after a neurotransmitter is released and activates its receptor. We might look at the synaptic level, about two connections between particular cells and say, how are the inputs to this cell affected by learning or experience? Say, uh, me, learning to, uh, me learning to, say, find my way through a particular, um, to, you know, say, find my way to a library or to a coffee house, for example. After I've had that experience and learned this information, how are the inputs to the cell responsible for allowing me to do that, strengthened uh, by that experience? We can ask about circuit level things, right? I, I've tried to imply to you that uh, these local networks are really important. And so activity in cell A can manifest as influences on cells B, C, and D, for example. And we're still learning a lot about the brain's anatomy. There's, uh, well, every day we're learning about potentially new pathways and, and gaining in, increased specificity into the types of connections that are made between different areas. So you might study how, say, for example, area Z connects to another area and how that input is organized. But I'll talk, I'll talk more in detail about the systems level of analysis, which is uh, the level that I study the brain. And really systems level neuroscience is, is wants to understand how brain functions and behavior manifest from the activity of cells and their interactions with each other. So one of the things that we uh, often do is record from the brain directly. If we wanna understand how the brain is processing external information, one way to do that is to record from neurons and actually uh, look at how that information that is presented out in the external world manifests as changes in activity in a cell. So uh, for example, what we do is we will lower an electrode into the brain. And if you park it close to a neuron, you can actually eavesdrop on its activity and then relate that activity to behavior. So I hope this plays, but what you're gonna hear is actually a recording of a neuron in a living brain uh, in a behaving subject. And it's gonna sound like popcorn popping. Was that all audible for everybody? Mm -hmm. So each of those pops is what's called an action potential or a spike. You, might, you may have heard those terms before. If not, that's OK. So every time one of those events happens, that triggers a cascade of activity through the neuron that enables it to communicate with other parts of the brain. So every time you hear a pop, that cell is sending a signal to whoever it's connected to. And so those represent the communication events of neurons with their, their partners. And so what we can do is we can record these uh, changes in activity. And here what I'm showing you is each tick mark here represents a spike every time a spike occurred. And this is showing you uh, activity over about a, uh, 1500 milliseconds or so. And it doesn't matter what's actually happening along the, the y-axis here, but just know that each row corresponds to a particular repetition. For example, let's say we're showing a particular visual stimulus to an animal, and that happens at time zero. 
And so at, at time zero, the stimulus occurs. And what you'd see is that the activity of the cell go increases, right? And so we can look at these patterns of activity over time, and we can relate that to either stimuli in the external world or the animal's behavior. Time zero here could represent a stimulus. It could rep represent a decision. Uh, say the animal decides to turn left versus right. It could represent when the animal moves its shoulder or its hand to reach for something, any of those things. It's just a way of relating the activity of brain cells back to behavior. And so what I've shown you here on the left is quite crude, uh, recording from one cell at a time. But uh, now we have modern technologies which enable us to record from hundreds of cells simultaneously in the brain. So uh, this uh, picture here on the top is uh, the, each of these black points represents a contact, allowing us to record from a thousand neurons spread, uh, or a thousand sites, excuse me, spread over about a centimeter of brain tissue, allowing us to get really uh, uh, large data sets uh, and relate da the data of lots of neurons simultaneously to behavior. Here is a, a, something called a Utah array. This is actually commonly used in uh, brain machine interfaces, for example. So the, uh, this type, type of recording electrode might be implanted in the brain of a paraplegic human, and then they can use activity on the different contacts to actually control, uh, say, a cursor on a computer screen so that person can interact with their environment. But in addition to uh, the electrical recordings, we've actually uh, developed tools to record optically from the brain. So instead of using electrical recordings, we can now use microscopy, uh, just microscopes and cameras uh, in order to uh, ca capture uh, brain activity. So here you're looking at the, this is the, uh, the top view of a mouse's brain. This mouse has been genetically engineered to express a fluorescent protein. But every time the a brain cell is active, it changes in fluorescence. And so using this approach, you can look more globally across the entire brain to look at how uh, changes in activity relate to what the animal is sensing or doing at that moment. And so hopefully the video comes through, but you can see these changes in fluorescence across the brain, uh, allowing you to really look on a global scale uh, uh, and rela again, relate these patterns of activity uh, to uh, sensory stimuli, uh, to spatial position, uh, to uh, decision-making and what have you. Moreover, you can zoom in, allowing us to actually watch the brain in action at a, a level of precision that we've really not had before. So here on the right is a field of neurons that express this, this fluorescent indicator. And what you can see is the activity of individual cells in time uh, across this field of view. And so every time one of these neurons is spiking, just like those pops you heard in that recording, uh, you get this change in fluorescence. And so we can go now and say, okay, of these neurons, who is related to, uh, to, to behavior, for example? And then get an idea across this large population. We're recording from hundreds of neurons at a time. And not only can we record from them, but we can see them. We know where they are in the brain. We know how they relate to one another in space and gain really precise information about uh, their, how their activity relates to behavior, but also how the whole circuit uh, relates uh, to behavior. So what can we do with this kind of information? So I'm going to show you some uh, just four quick uh, idea to give you four quick ideas of the kind of information that we can gain from these kinds of recordings. So a fundamental question about how our, our brains mediate our interactions with the environment. Uh, one question might be, well, how do I know where I am in space at this particular moment? It's kind of an important question. Uh, especially now in the days of Waze, right? <laughs> Where my spatial map is completely messed up because I just look at my phone. So um, what this is showing is the, the black lines correspond to the position of a mouse in an arena uh, during a, like an hour long period where the animal was able to freely explore this environment. And they were recording from a particular part of the brain in this case. And each red dot corresponds to when that neuron was active. What I hope you can appreciate here is that uh, this neuron was active in a grid-like pattern in this uh, arena. Basically, with some repeating pattern, the neuron looked like it was representing uh, sort of a, a regular spacing of the environment. And this is just another, uh, another example, but you can convert that data into this heat plot. <clears throat> 
And so what this shows is that this, this cell is only firing when the animal occupies a particular location in this grid. In addition, you can also find cells that respond like this, where they only fire in one particular location. That is, the cell is only active when the animal is at this particular spot. Now, this is just one cell, but imagine if you had 10,000 of these that each represented a different location or a different grid, slightly offset grid. This would give you a way of recreating from your brain activity where you are in your environment. What about movements? So, you know, we are, uh, you know, we locomote through our environment. We use our hands to uh, interact with uh, tools. We are a, a tool using species. Um, for example, you know, we, one of our major tools are our phones, for example. So um, really the, it, we still actually have a very poor understanding about how our cortex actually generates the complex movements that we are able to emit. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll quickly summarize uh, some data uh, to show you how we're starting to think about this kind of information. So what these this traces down here at the bottom labeled hand kinematics represent is here the subject was asked to trace particular um, pathways on a screen. And uh, they're coded in different colors. And so each trace, each line here corresponds to an individual repetition where the animal had to make a particular tracing movement. And don't worry at all about what neural state space means. Uh, they recorded from many, many neurons simultaneously. And it's impossible to show you data in 50 dimensions. So what they've done is compress that data down into two dimensions. And you can look at how that ac the activity of these 50 neurons changes in time. And what you can see is that the activity correspond, it, the activity moves through this compressed uh, uh, space in a very characteristic fashion for locomotor movements going in the upward direction in red or the downward direction in green. And it's this kind of approach, the, this way of compressing this really complex data, this data that encompasses not just hand position, but elbow position, shoulder position, uh, wrist position, et cetera, uh, into this really reduced uh, uh, representation. And yet it still explains a ton of the variability in the animal's uh, hand movements, for example. And so it's exactly this kind of approach that is gaining a lot of traction and helping us understand how uh, something like uh, our, our, uh, the activity of neurons in our motor cortex can coordinate this complex movement through our environment. Lastly, this, or not lastly, but uh, importantly, this is also a, a key question I would say is that, um, how do we make decisions between uh, two good options, for example? So <clears throat> it, you can imagine that uh, you're in the supermarket and you're trying to decide between say sesame bagels or cinnamon raisin bagels, for example. And you might think to yourself, well, you know, I prefer, for me personally, I prefer sesame. So let's say that in this case, B represents sesame and C represents cinnamon raisin. If you offer me one sesame or one cinnamon raisin, I'm going to choose almost all of the time, I'm going to choose the sesame bagel. But instead, if you offer me six cinnamon raisin uh, versus one sesame, I'm gonna be very likely to choose the cinnamon raisin because hey, that's an entire week of bagels. And we can map out a subject's behavior making exactly these kinds of decisions where there's really no wrong answer, right? This is just a completely subjective preference. And if you record from the uh, frontal parts of the brain where, where we tend to find signals related to abstract decision making, we can find signals that correspond to exactly these kinds of variables. And that really sort of that map perfectly on to a subject's decisions. And co correspondingly, you can record from a different subject which has an entirely different set of subjective preferences and find that their activity in, in that same part of the brain will also represent these uh, kinds of variables, but only according to that subject's preferences. Uh, so this is what's known as sort of economic decision-making. And even with these sort of complex, really abstract personal decisions, we're able to find uh, relationships between uh, brain activity and behavior that really maps onto these uh, subjective rankings uh, of the external world. Okay, and so now we'll transition more into the areas of neuroscience that, that I study. I just wanted to give you a flavor for some of the different questions and things that could be answered uh, using these kinds of approaches.
and in the slides that remain, um, we'll talk a, a lot about vision. Um, I saw the chat pop up. Were there any questions coming in? I, I have big dis I have big questions, but I think it's better if we leave them till the end about consciousness and consciousness whether um, uh, what you know whether neuroscience science is mainly studying behavior, but also how consciousness, our experience of consciousness uh, comes together through all of these different inputs. Um, and and if you'd be able to keep your job, if you ever thought, if you ever mentioned that consciousness could come from outside of the brain or not, but maybe we'll, we'll talk about that afterwards. Sure, 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 yes. Um, and I see a question from Carol about dementia. Uh, yes, I can, I'll touch on that maybe at the end, if that's okay. We can go into more of a general question and answer period, if that's all right. Um, <clears throat> so let me just back up a little bit. So what's really interesting about vision is it, is it really in the brain? It seems to be uh, made up of a um, an elaboration on um, increasingly complex features. So in the very back of the brain, at the very entry point into the cortex, uh, the the cells here tend to represent things that are the sort of building blocks of perception. Uh, so you can think about things like lines and edges and sort of the boundaries between what you're looking at and the background, for example. And if you move up into the next area, you might find representations that are related to shapes and colors. And by the time you get to the end of the temporal lobe here on the side of the head, you find cells that really correspond, or that really tend to respond only to very particular objects, including cells that are selective exclusively for human faces, which is really, really intriguing. Along this other pathway, which goes, uh, moves along what's called the parietal cortex, it actually doesn't have anything to do with object recognition. It's much more about understanding uh, spatial relationships between objects and their motion relative to one another. And we know that these uh, representations are causally involved in, in uh, these kinds of perceptions because when human subjects experience lesions like a stroke in one of these locations, they can develop what's called, say, in the case of the temporal lobe, object agnosia. For example, a subject with this particular uh, disorder might not be able to look at a vase and actually identify it. It'll just look like a distorted uh, set of forms to them. Or you can even have what's called prosopagnosia, which is uh, essentially face blindness. They become unable to recognize faces, even of people they know. Um, alternatively, if you experience a lesion along this dorsal pathway, this uh, the sort of spatial awareness pathway, you can develop issues with uh, perceiving motion. Life almost appears as a series of snapshots. Uh, or alternatively, you might experience the inability to say, like with the case of this object, I could identify that it's, it's my coffee holder, but I wouldn't be able to contort my hand in the way to hold it properly. Uh, so there really is this distinguishing functions along these two pathways in, in our visual system that each give rise to important parts of our conscious experience and, and our awareness. But uh, what I study is actually way back here in the very entry points of the brain. What our research is trying to understand is how the brain actually under, decodes information. That is how the brain translates sensory input into neural activity and into perception uh, here in these really fundamental building blocks of all perception uh, back here in the earliest stages of visual processing. So I'll just uh, quickly give you an example of how this information might be represented. So what you find back here in the back of the brain is cells that are responsible for uh, representing, say, orientation, right? The orientation of a line, whether that line is horizontal or vertical. And uh, what this is showing you is the responses of an, of an individual neuron. And what you, for this neuron, what ends up what you can see is that the, uh, this neuron tends to respond preferentially to uh, objects in the visual field that are oriented at 45 degrees. And each of these tick marks here represents a spike, one of those action potentials that we, we listened to earlier. If you instead rotate that stimulus to horizontal, the cell doesn't respond at all. Or if that stimulus is vertical, the cell doesn't respond at all either. So what this, what this is demonstrating is that these uh, neurons in this early stage of the visual cortex are, are detecting particular features in a very selective way. They tend to only respond to particular orientations. And this is a map of the visual cortex flattened out so you can see it. 
and each color corresponds to a particular orientation. And so what this pinwheel like color map represents is basically a unit where different cells in different locations represent different orientations. So each, each unit has cells that respond to each orientation. And if you repeat those units all across the visual cortex, now you've created a system for understanding which orientations are present in the visual scene at this moment. So for example, if I presented a horizontal line to this subject, then only these areas that are red would be active and the other areas would not be. And so this is a way of translating visual information into neural activity. But the question that, that we're trying to address is how does that neural activity actually become perception? So, and this is a really difficult question because it's clearly not a perfect relationship between the activity of brain cells and perception. And I wanna illustrate that uh, here. So, for example, if at this moment the stimulus is turned on and each of these spikes is uh, evoked by this stimulus, what I hope you can appreciate is if you look at individual, representa individual presentations of the stimulus, that no pattern of spiking is like the other. They're all different. The pattern is not repeatable. The one thing that is repeatable is that there's more activity over here than here, but the precise uh, timing of these spikes isn't at all consistent across repeated presentations. The brain is really noisy. It has to be immune to this variability in order to accurately perceive the world. And this is one of the reasons why I really dislike the, the analogy of the brain as a computer. So if anyone speaks um, binary, <laughs> which I, I hope no one does, because that would be really difficult to learn, um, if we have a particular pattern of ones and zeros, say for example, spike or no spike, uh, spike or no spike, and we translate that, well, we get West Suburban Temple Har Zion. If I take that same pattern of spikes or no spike, and I, I just, all I do is switch one to the other, I end up with nothing, essentially meaningless information. So this, the brain must be immune to this variability. But the question is what aspects of this activity that is evoked by sensory stimuli actually correspond to perception? So how can we address this question? So the approach that we've taken is to alter the, the activity of the, of the brain it, that's, that's uh, evoked in response to sensory stimuli and look at how that affects a, a subject's perception. And so by, by manipulating these sens sensory responses and looking at how that affects perception, we can gain insight into what aspects of that activity are actually causally involved in driving the conscious experience. And so I'll talk to you a little bit about how we do that. Um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up with a couple of videos. So we leverage uh, a technique that was uh, pioneered a few years ago. What we do is we steal a light sensitive protein from algae and we package it into little viruses. We inject it into the brain where now we can cause the neurons to express this light sensitive protein. So for centuries, the go-to method for activating brain tissue has been electrical stimulation. If you put electrical current into the brain, you can cause cells to spike. The problem with this method is that it activates everything really in a really non-specific way. Well, under normal conditions, the brain is not at all sensitive to light. You can shine light on it all day and it won't change acti the activity of cells. But once they express this light sensitive protein, now we have a way of controlling the activity of individual cells with light. And if we do this during behavior, we can alter the activity of cells and look at how that affects, say, perceptual decisions about stimuli that we present. So this is just uh, an example showing you the level of control that we have for uh, neural activity. So each of these blue pulses represents a time that a light was flashed. And each of these traces here represents a spike. And so basically when we want the cells to be active, we can make them active and we can do so uh, pretty reliably. Similarly, we can just shut off cells. So here are a bunch of spikes. And when we uh, shine a light on this particular protein, 
uh, this particular virus that's been expressed in the cells, we can also we can turn them off. So how how so what we end up doing is we implant windows, optical windows over the brain. We uh, then can determine a map of the visual space underneath the window. So for example, this purple feature corresponds to when stimuli are presented in the lower part of the monitor. This green area corresponds to when stimuli are presented in this upper part of the monitor. And shown here below is the same window where um, the uh, in red is the cells that express this, this light sensitive protein. And in white is the light being shown through an optic fiber where we can use uh, the uh, virus to turn cells on or off. And I won't go into a lot of detail here. I'll just quickly summarize some of the things that we've done. But we've used this general approach to really deeply understand uh, aspects of, of the relationship between uh, brain activity and perception. So in this first study, we basically what we did is we used this method to alter the activity of these different, uh, these three cells you see here. Basically, all the information being sent out of particular brain areas is mediated by these green cells here within, labeled with an E. These are the excitatory neurons that send information to other parts of the brain. Their activity is strongly regulated by these different inhibitory cells. And what we, we use this approach to more deeply understand how their activity uh, shapes uh, the relationship between the activity of these cells and perception. In the second study, we uh, used direct activation of these neurons, the excitatory neurons that go to other parts of the brain, and augmented their activity in very particular ways to deep, more deeply understand the dynamics of their activity and how that related to perception. What, what types of changes in their activity uh, mapped onto uh, the relationship between sensory input and perception? And lastly, we developed another method, a new method, that uh, allowed us to precisely estimate the periods of activity that were critical for perception. So for example, we showed a visual stimulus that caused uh, hundreds of milliseconds of, of, of changes in spiking, but it only looked like 50 milliseconds of that activity was actually critical for informing perception. So what that means is that even though activity was con continuing on in this particular brain area, the brain was only using about 50 milliseconds of that activity to generate the percept, allowing us to, to really precisely estimate which windows of activity are actually critical for perception. And more recently, we've been doing a lot of engineering. Um, so the, lights, the light uh, stimulation approaches I was telling you about earlier are quite nonspecific. They uh, basically, we shine light through a piece of tissue and it produces an activation pattern like this, where there's basically a column of excited cells. More recently, we've been developing approaches and building machinery to present stimuli that look more like this. So what you can see here is this individual point of stimulation. And this point of stimulation is about the size of a neuron. So you can imagine now if we had 20 or 30 points and they were all targeted on particular cells, we could very precisely augment the activity of, of brain uh, in, a, uh, a, in, in a, a much more precise fashion. So uh, these are, this is an optical system that I've built over the last couple of years. Um, these are uh, two high powered lasers that all get focused through this large uh, optical system in order to generate uh, stimulation patterns that look like this. And so the ultimate goal of that work is to uh, precisely target cells. So for example, if we go back to this recording, and we look at the activity of the brain and we say, oh, you know what? I think that cell and this cell are actually really important. Those cells are always active whenever the animal gets, the, gets this, uh, de properly detects a stimulus or performs the behavior correctly. I'm gonna go in and I'm going to shut off those cells activity to see if they're actually causally involved in the, in the perception or in the behavior, for example. Allowing us to really dissect the neural code in ways that we couldn't before. Uh, and gain really precise insight into mappings between the external world and, and behavior. And so why, why would that be important? So if, so at a fundamental level, this would revolutionize our understanding of the way information is actually encoded and decoded from brain activity. 
But once armed with that kind of information, it gives us a newfound insight into how to properly insert signals into neural tissue, which is incredibly important for things like neural prosthetics. You can imagine if, that if we understood the neural code, that we could then uh, implement that information into a prosthetic device to insert signals into the brain of someone who's had their sight taken by injury or lost their limb uh, in an accident uh, in order to most uh, effectively insert signals into their brain uh, such that they can recover that lost function. And so I'll just show you a couple examples of uh, how that kind of information uh, could aid uh, human life. And then we'll conclude with questions. After losing his sight in a car accident, Jason Esperhazen never dreamed he'd see light or movement again. But with the flick of a switch, wow. his world suddenly grew brighter. I still can't put it into words. I mean, from, going, from being able to see absolutely nothing, it's pitch black, to all of a sudden seeing little flickers of light move around. While it's not normal sight, a groundbreaking device implanted in Jason's brain at UCLA help allows him to navigate the world around him. Being able to tell where a doorway is, being able to tell where the sidewalk begins or ends, or where the crosswalk is, are all extremely meaningful events that can help these people regain some form of independence. Dr. Nader Paradian implanted the device made by Second Sight over the visual cortex in Jason's brain. The Orion device converts images from a tiny video camera on a pair of sunglasses into a series of electrical pulses. Those pulses stimulate electrodes in Jason's brain that let him see patterns of light that act as visual cues. We uh, basically have the video camera and the video processing unit functioning or performing the functions of what the eye normally does, and we go directly back to the brain. By moving his head, Jason can distinguish light areas and objects from dark. Little white dots on a black background. It's like looking up at the stars at night. Only the world's second person to receive the device, Jason is helping the technology to grow more useful as he learns what each flicker of light represents. And someone moving across the room, walking past me or walking away from me or it's a light against the wall. It was just amazing to have some form of functional vision again. Now he can perform everyday tasks he couldn't before, like sort laundry and safely cross the street. And with a little practice, I'm closing the camera to show you that I'm not cheating. Jason continues to expand what he can do. At UCLA Health, this is Barb Consiglio reporting. And I'll show you one more uh, example. Over the past probably decade, there's been a big push to improve the mechanics of the hand, thinking about the improved prosthesis. Um, but unfortunately, without sensation, it doesn't matter how good the hand is, you still can't perform at a human level. My name is Igor Spedic, approximately five and a half years ago, I was injured in an industrial accident, which resulted in the amputation of my hand. Prosthetic Lens has spent a lot of time in development mechanics, the electronics, the control systems, all the engineering pieces we can think of. The thing that's been lacking has been the sense of touch, actual feedback, a truly closed loop feedback system. So what we have been able to add here is that feedback. I have to squeeze a little bit harder, but I can feel it in my index and barely in my thumb because it has weight to send it. It's my thing that sensation my fingers are just crunching. <laughs> when the hand is lost, the sensors of the hand are gone, but all the wiring that used to connect the nerves are still intact. The thing that's different about what we're doing from prior approaches is that we have electrodes directly on the residual nerve um, that's in this left of the arm. That allows us to connect to the prior system for feedback that were there before. So we placed electrodes in Igor's forearm about this level uh, that connect directly onto the purple nerves. And there's wires underneath of the skin and then out to the side here that we can connect with an electrical stimulation system. That signal travels up to his brain and then he feels as though it's his hand. When somebody loses uh, their hand or an appendage, they lose, we often think about just the function that's been lost. The reality is they've also lost all the sensory connection. And that is probably the thing that makes us human in many ways. It's the piece that connects us to the world around us. It's the piece that connects us to other people. But that's the sensation I normally wouldn't do this. I would do it with my left hand because I can't feel what I'm holding. I don't know how much pressure that I would use to hold the object firmly. But with the sensation, 
I can put it in and I feel the sensation in my index finger and I'm holding it enough where it's not pulling the yoke out, forcing the yoke out. Feels great to have my hand back. You know, the, did you notice that he said my hand back again? That's the critical element of this work is that by making this, uh, inserting these signals in a way that feels natural, it has basically become an extension of him. He's treating it, he's calling it his hand, uh, which I think is a really, uh, it's really important to point that out in the language that he uses. It's not my prosthetic, it's my hand because it feels natural to him. So um, I'll just take this moment before we start answering questions, just to say that none of this work would be possible without federal and private research support. Uh, and so a lot of our work is funded by the National Institute of Health, which is the largest funder of uh, academic research in the United States, but there's many other uh, private foundations as well as other sources like the NSF and, and DARPA, for example, that are interested in, in developing these kinds of technologies. Um, I'll just point out that uh, the National Institute of Health budget is only about four times that of Pfizer. So all of the academic research going on in the United States, uh, the NIH is the key funder, and yet uh, its budget is only about four times that of, uh, of a major pharmaceutical company. So um, I, and please encourage your Senate uh, and House representatives uh, to support the NIH. Um, and I'll quickly just say thank you to amazing technicians who have helped me with some of my research, uh, particularly Megan, Elizabeth and Morgan, who have all been really instrumental in uh, helping uh, with a lot of the work that I briefly summarized, as well as uh, my advisor, John Manzel, who, uh, whose lab I, I work in. And with that, thank you guys for your attention. Thank you so much, Jackson. That was really, really fascinating and, and um, made me think at the end, it was, I guess it's a question that one day you might get to a point where you learn how to work those inputs you could fool you could have a brain and then fool all of its senses and yeah. create, you could create a different reality than what its senses are actually experiencing and you could have a, just a standalone brain you know, <laughs> kind of working yeah. is, it, is that kind of the direction i mean not obviously going for that but is that what you're trying to understand how it's it's definitely not the goal and i i don't think we're we're um could you know 500 to 1,000 years from now, something like that be possible? I, I would say never say never. But um, at this point, we're still, um, you know, we're still reaching to understand, you know, what is the code for, for the vertical representation of a line in your visual field, right? Like, you, I don't know if you could see in that video that I showed of the guy with the retinal prosthetic, but they showed a quick cut of his, what his, his input looks like. And it was incredibly, incredibly crude. Um, the complexity of, of, I think your question also relates to your other question about um, sort of consciousness, right? Like, could we replicate consciousness? And I don't think we could do that from just inserting sensory signals into the brain, right? You bring your, all of your past experiences, the mood that you're in in this moment, the uh, what happened to you five seconds ago into this current moment, right? All of that is also being simultaneously represented in your brain at the same moment it's receiving new sensory input. And without being able to, uh, the, we're a long way from understanding those kinds of, of brain processes, right? I'm, our work is at the sensory periphery, the very, very early stages of sensory processing because that's what we understand the best. We have not been able to march deeper into the brain yet and get to anything close to like what, you know, what emotion or um, uh, the, or how you know the connection between say memories and emotion that you might bring into a particular moment. Um, but what I say, I, I will also never say never. So that's my political answer, I guess. Thanks so much. Well, before I get into the the, the questions, which for me as a rabbi, I'm always in thinking about, which is, um, you know, the existence of that consciousness coming from outside the brain. I'd like to take other questions. So Hillary asked, aside from your own work. What research in the field of neuroscientists is most neuroscientists is most exciting to you? Yeah, um, I would say I think if I I would if I had to do it over again, if I or if I had to choose a different path, I should say not do it over again. But if I was to choose was to make a, a hard transition, I think I would go straight to um, brain computer interface. Um, it's kind of related to what we do, um, but uh, I think we're getting close to generating you know, prosthetics that people are 
are treating as their own limbs, uh, which is really, really just a truly remarkable thing to think about, right? You have this artificial device uh, like that gentleman had, and it, the signals that he's experiencing feel just like it's his own hand, uh, to the point that he, he basically considers it his own hand. Um, I think there's, um, there's also immense progress can be made in that regard with, with, to people who are uh, basically paraplegic, who their only capability of interacting with the outside world might be through a computer, for example. Uh, and so a lot of that, that field uh, takes, um, uh, borrows from some of our insights and we borrow from theirs. Um, so there is a close relationship. If I had to go really far afield, I think some of the work going on in flies actually is really, really interesting. So it sounds funny to say this, but Drosophila research, um, they have this exquisite ability to target even like a, down to a single neuron to, re to relate behavior to like a single neuron in the fly brain because of their level of genetic control. And as somebody who wants to understand the relationship between neurons and behavior, it's really, uh, every time I attend one of their talks, I get really envious because it's like, oh, we just wanted to engineer a tool to do that. So we made a fly that had this particular gene turned on in this particular cell and look, we, we solved it. We figured it out completely. And so that, that's always been um, my, uh, the source of my envy, I guess. So. Thank you. How, how did you get into neuroscience? Science? Um, so my interest stemmed, so I started off outside of sensory systems. I worked in, um, my interest came from wanting to understand sort of maladaptive behaviors. Um, basically, why do we, why do humans engage in things that bring them harm, even though they know that it brings them harm? You know, things like drug addiction, obesity, overeating, things like that. Uh, and so my initial work in neuroscience was all based in the brain circuits that control those kinds of behaviors. Um, and over time, I just became more interested in this idea of information and coding and decoding and slowly made a transition off in that direction. But um, I'm planning some experiments in the future that kind of bring some of those circuits together uh, in interesting ways because um, I think that is sort of, there's, a, there's a, a unique angle to take with respect to those two lines of research. Thank you. Um, Bob and Mimi Miller ask, can you please comment on progress being made for brain repair? Yes. Um, so there, there isn't a, a lot of active research going on in, in trying to understand molecular mechanisms involved in tissue repair, or alternatively trying to understand the molecular cascades that are involved in, uh, in neurodegenerative diseases, right? If we can stop those particular mechanisms, then we can stop diseases from progressing, which isn't quite repair, but it relates pretty closely to, to your question. Um, so I can just say broadly with respect to things like ALS or Alzheimer's uh, and, uh, other, um, and other like Huntington's, Huntington's disease and things like that, um, there's a, a lot of active research going on, not only to identify very precisely the mechanisms that cause them to happen, but also um, identify um, potential ways to um, uh, 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 maybe engage uh, mechanisms that already exist in the brain to activate them to uh, repair tissue in the case of, of progressed disease. Thank you. But I mean, there's there's clearly so uh, such a, a big field of of um, factors that influences something even like, like ALS or Alzheimer's with not only the gener degeneration of brain cells, but also you know, trauma, for example, um, or other, other factors. And it just, sometimes it just makes one think of how, how, how broad that field of consciousness is. It's for bringing in you know, neuroscience, but there's so much other, other aspects going on in determining some of the, some of the fields of study. Do you, do you guys talk about that in your field or you're so specific in your projects or? Um... So like how much do we pay attention to things going on in other areas of, of neuroscience? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, we definitely, so every week we gather together and read literature, like read papers from other groups. And those sometimes those papers are really focused on sort of nitty gritty molecular type questions. Um, or we're, we'll read something that's very, very specific, you know, to the types of questions uh, I, I talked about today. But it really is, I think, important to maintain a broad approach. The other thing that we do is um, we invite speakers from 
all over different universities all over the world that come and give talks and share their work. And that gives us a much um, broader uh, perspective because these might be individuals that work on very different questions. They might be invited by the person who works down the hall who works on very molecular mechanisms. And so by attending those meetings, it helps us keep our finger on the pulse of all these different areas at once, so to speak. But we definitely specialize. I hope I, you know, I, I think my work kind of made that not clear that we're, we do exist in little niches. Um, I also want to uh, emphasize like neuroscience is a really young discipline, right? Like this, the first PhD in neuroscience at Stanford was like in the fifties, um, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe a little before that, but um, you know, easily within the last hundred years. And so compare this to physics, right? Like particle physics, where the way that people get work done in particle physics is to combine, you know, eight or nine countries together and hundreds of people. Whereas neuroscience, we still understand so little, like me and my boss can make a new insight because uh, there's just still so much, so, such a long uh, road to travel. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that's, a, that's a, it's an interesting observation for like the, the immaturity of the field so far. Mm, thanks so much. Well, you, you said at the beginning you'd gone maybe three inches out of a mile. <laughs> is, there, is there something specific that would be a breakthrough that would some, somehow open up the next hundred feet or even yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great question. So um, I think with the kinds of technologies that we're working on where we're talking about really sort of precisely mapping the activity of particular cells to behavior, I think that's like the, that's gonna be the, the foot in the door to really break through with um, this idea of information coding and brain decoding of that information. Um, and so the first like real big insight in that, uh, that area, it's going to revolutionize not just system neuroscience, but all of the computational models that people build to, under, to, to, to form maps between um, information and brain activity or information and brain activity and behavior. It will like basically create a whole new set of constraints that we can use to guide future investigations because right now we're, we're um, still in the very infant stages of understanding those kinds of relationships. For you know, only in the last, you know, 10 or so years have we really gotten to uh, augment brain activity within any sort of precision. Um, so before it was basically, we just, we'd do a recording and we'd say, okay, what was the brain doing before the animal did X or when the animal did X? And we, all we had was correlations, right? A correlation between brain activity and behavior. Now we actually have the causal manipulation. Uh, what, you know, what effect did we have on the network? And what, what was the resultant effect on behavior to, to guide our thinking about the, the causal relationships between the two? And so as we refine more, on de more details in that regard, um, I think it will really uh, kick open the door, so to speak. At least that's my hope, so. Thank you so much. Um, one more question, Morris asked, the, the synapse you discussed, is there, is there communication both electrical and chemical? Yes, that's a really great question. So um, yeah, there, there is definitely both in cert certain uh, circumstances. There are cells that can be completely electrically coupled together where the activity of one actually, electrical changes in one affect the, it's the one it's connected to. Um, but most, uh, most uh, synaptic communication is really taking a chemical signal, the release of neurotransmitter, the activation of that receptor, so the neurotransmitter is the chemical signal, but that gets converted into an electrical signal inside the cell. And so the brain is basically going from chemical to electrical, to chemical to electrical, from chemical to electrical, all the way down the chain uh, the entire time. But there are definitely cells that exist in the brain where they're, they're completely electrically coupled. Um, and we find new ones all the time. Um, but I, I'm actually happy to stay on and keep answering questions if people want. Um, I see there's a few more that we haven't got to. We have Fran's question. Have you done any work for people with brain tumors or closed head injuries? I have not. Um, yes, yeah, so that, that is outside of, 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 of um, my area of expertise, but it is a, a pretty active line of research uh, in, with some of our colleagues um, related to you know, people interested in understanding the mechanisms of like chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE, which is becoming, uh, people are starting to appreciate more and more. Um, so there is a lot of work in that regard, uh, especially as it relates back to the question on brain repair is, you know, what kinds of things can we be doing to ensure the brain is protected as quickly as possible following some sort of traumatic event, um, like a, say a car accident or some sort of head trauma. Um, 
And then, oh, Carol asked me about how, can I comment on how dementia affects the brain? I think I am not really an expert in this regard. Um, I would love to give you a really detailed question uh, or answer to this question, um, but uh, it, is, it, it is kind of far afield from my expertise, so I don't want to put my foot in my mouth. Sorry about that. But I could easily look it up and send you an email. And can I ask one more question? Do you sure. ever um, work with psychologists or therapists about EMDR, the tapping solution? I have not have heard of that. I have not heard of this, but I have uh, friends who work in, in therapy that I, can, that I can ask. Okay, because it's very interesting and it works. It definitely yes. works. EMDR, let me take a look real quick. I'll just pull up my- It's eye, eye movement and well, I'm trying to remember the R and the D. I move um, and reprocessing. Yes. I'll have to take a look. Um, yeah, yeah I, I don't know much about that, but eye movements actually can be very diagnostic for neurological diseases in humans mm -hmm. uh, because that is, we, we're visual creatures and that's how we interact with the world, right? We don't walk over to something and look at it and touch it or walk over to something and touch it. We just, you know, avert our gaze to it and inspect mm -hmm. it with our eyes. Um, so eye movements can be really informative. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yeah. <laughs> so no more questions. I'd like to ask my philosophical question, my rabbi question, which is, um, you know, in, in your, I mean, neuroscience does touch on consciousness, right, on some level and how consciousness is produced. Mm -hmm. And in your field, um, is it heresy to talk about consciousness coming from outside of the brain as in that kind of, I guess, foundational belief of religion that the life comes from however we, each tradition calls it a soul or some other aspect. Um, is that, is it, does that conversation ever come up between neuroscientists? I would say, I, I think we spend our time so far in the weeds on um, very much smaller questions because we're still trying to sort out the, the really small stuff that I, it doesn't come up a lot, but I will, um, but there are people out there who do write, uh, who are very, you know, uh, high ranking, very visible neuroscientists who, you know, do write uh, uh, papers on relationships between say perception, awareness, and consciousness, um, and try to, trying to understand like, what is the, what, what kinds of, what kind of a brain is capable of generating a, co a conscious experience? What, is that, does, is C. elegans, the worm that I showed you in the very beginning with 302 neurons, is that conscious? Um, trying to understand what kinds of, what kinds of criteria would you need in order to make that classification? Um, in my own opinion, I'll say that you know, this goes back to the idea of emergence, right? Like we understand how a single neuron behaves really, really well. We, you know, we've got very precise mathematical computational models of the relationships between the, uh, the inputs to a cell and its activity. We have no fundamental model for what happens when you chain 80 billion of those guys together and what could possibly, what kinds of complexity could manifest or emerge from that, uh, that kind of a system. And so in my view, that completely leaves open the possibility for, uh, for something to exist that's far beyond uh, just a, a collection of 80 billion neurons. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your, your work and your research. Um, uh, I see one, one question that came up. Yeah, it looks like someone had damage to the cochlea. Oh, so someone has tinnitus? Is that what um, the question from the phone number? So um, what happens, so the, the question is, uh, someone has recently experienced damage to the hair type structure in the ear. So um, uh, in the ear, there's all kind. there's a, an array of cells that are actually coupled to hairs. Basically, they look like little, little me mechanistic hairs. And then when sound waves hit them, they vibrate and that generates our experience of sound. And they're asking what happens, they had damage to those. And I think it sounds like they're experiencing a ringing sensation, which is uh, tinnitus. Um, 
it's not necessarily a source of confusion. Um, is it more so it is um, there might be some sort of persistent activity in the in that circuit that's uh, leading to this persistent experience of a, of a, of a particular sound. Um, but I'd have to know more details about the the um, particular uh, uh, insult to to be able to comment more directly. But it, it will probably go away over time. Could, could there be a could there be a, a moment where you you'd be able to go into the brain and turn off that 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 new, that area that's receiving that input from that hair and stop the tinnitus from happening? Um, you you could probably do that now without much precision, just by um, you know there's there's actually stimulation devices that you can use outside the brain using magnetic stimulation, uh, which would basically kind of deliver. A, they're actually starting to use this for uh, treatment resistant depression and other um, uh, uh, other uh, neural conditions where you basically kind of like hitting the reset button on a brain area you kind of just uh, 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 give it enough perturbation where it kind of it's kind of it's kind of like hitting the reset button so to speak so, sounds a little dangerous railroad engineers that I've worked with have terrible problems no. with tinnitus over the years I believe it yeah Thank you for sharing, Jackson. Thank you. I really appreciate you guys coming and thank you for listening. Uh, hopefully I, I didn't get too deep in the weeds. I, um... No, thank it was, you. It was very interesting. Thank you, this was very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jackson, that was a very good talk. Thank you. That's a good comment, Charisse. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you. We'll have our next Temple Talk um, several weeks from now. Thank you, Jackson, for sharing and for putting together the, the presentation and the talk. And I, I, I would like to hear more, so we'll, we'll have to. Yeah, I'll, I'll be here all day. So, you know, you can, if you want to stay all, we can keep talking. That's good. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.